Welcome to B&B Movie Reviews. This week we go back to a galaxy far, far away for the 25th anniversary of The Phantom Menace. And we go full spoilers for one of the best seasons of television in quite a while with our review and breakdown of X-Men 97. Stay right there. B&B is up next. Obi-Wan and Darth Maul go head-to-head -head in the climax of The Phantom Menace in arguably one of the most exciting and riveting lightsaber duels in the Star Wars saga. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people like it. I love uh, that lightsaber uh, duel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this movie, 25 years, oh my gosh. and it returned to the big screen. It did. Did you get a chance to see it on Heck the big yeah. screen again? In this movie occupies such a huge space in my imagination. Like it's it's hard to tell people who were not there in 1999 what it was like. You know, we had the re-releases of the original trilogy yeah, in theater in 97. Seven, yep. And you know, here comes like the first Star Wars and like it seemed like forever. We didn't yeah. think they were possible. And we're going back to the beginning. I remember downloading this trailer. It took hours to download this trailer online, and then I would watch, watch it in a like little bit, little pieces. And it was like, that. It was that. Fog, it was like that scene with the fog, and you start to see like. Yeah. The and, and you're like, like okay, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then Jar Jar is there, and he says something. You're like, oh, oh okay. okay, all right. And then you know, it finally comes out. Midnight releases. Yeah. You're like, well, this doesn't quite feel like my Star Wars, and then you had to reckon with it not yeah. being your Star Wars, and yeah. now that's okay. And so now here we are, 25 years later, we've had another Star Wars sequel. Star Wars is on TV every freaking week. Yeah. We've got cartoons yeah. and short films. <laughs> It's a lot of a lot of content. Like, of people don't like that word. But. How do you feel about the Phantom Menace now? Like, do you feel like you about it the way you did in '99, or has that evolved? You know what's interesting about me and my relationship with the Phantom Menace is the fact that when I originally saw that movie, and maybe this is, speaks for most people. I liked the movie when I originally saw it, and I know a lot of people, like you were saying, kind of had to reckon with it after seeing it five, six, seven yeah, times. Yeah, a lot of us man the children, you know, really had to grow up. <laughs> yeah, but um, I didn't really have a problem with the movie until years later, or maybe it was probably when Attack of the Clones came out. But I really didn't have much, and of course, the internet was different back then. But looking back on that trilogy. As years have gone by, and especially after the prequels were finished after 2005, yeah, the movie really didn't sit that well with me. But now, because of all the Star Wars content that we've gotten, especially with the animated series. Yeah, the Clone Wars. The Clone Wars, that really fills in a lot of the gaps and really kind of fleshes out that era, yeah, that I, period. I feel like it takes the ideas of the prequel trilogy yeah. and, and makes something with them, right? Yeah. And I think that's my takeaway with re-watching The Phantom Menace, is I feel like there are some strong ideas. Lucas was getting yeah. extremely political with The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. And he was just not necessarily executing it to the height that I would have liked. It's interesting because it feels like we were at a turning point uh, in the late 90s when it comes to technology. Yes. Because 99, 99 was a big year in cinema. Matrix. And Matrix, and we wish we reviewed the 25th anniversary for that. But the Matrix in tandem with episode one, especially with visual technology, visual effects, was a turning point for cinema. 
And I think Lucas really kind of got caught up. And for, for better or for worse, and I think there are a lot of uh, great things that, that, that did come out of that. You know, but we're living in the world that exactly, he created, right? Exactly. You know, fully digitized characters, shooting entirely on digital. Now, Phantom Menace was the last Star Wars film shot on film. Attack mm. of the Clones was the first digital movie. Yeah. You know, like, we're living in what he was seeking yes. with the technology of the Phantom Menace. Yeah. And, you know, you can't deny the technology on display of the Phantom Menace. Yeah. That being said, I also think, like, the actors at the time were not necessarily prepared, prepared. Yes. for all the blue screen work that yeah. they would be doing here. And yeah. you can really sense that detachment yeah. in this movie and yeah. watch the eye line. I was just about to say the eye lines. <laughs> uh, that first scene with Jar Jar and Obi-Wan is talking to yeah, him. It's and rough. I was like, it's rough. Oh. Also, this movie is so aggressive in its additional dialogue recording. It's ADR. Okay. Uh, like from the jump. Once, you know, like, we're also getting like a ton of accents. For some reason, George Lucas is like, we're going to have every kind of accent in this movie. It is oppressive. Yes. Uh, and also racist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and then you just have like the simple ADR. Like Natalie Portman is clearly not saying the words that are coming out of her mouth in this movie. Yeah. And that goes yeah. for every single every, character. Every single it's character. It's really distracting. No, it, it really is. And again, like I said, they're trying to work through a lot of this. And I appreciate the attempts. Um, and like you were saying, I think when you look at the bare bones of the story of the prequels, especially with The Phantom Menace, there's a great story there telling the story of a young Anakin and how he becomes Darth yeah, Vader. Yeah, how do we get Darth how Vader's, do, yeah, right? How do, like, how do we this? get Adolf Hitler's? Like, that's what yeah. he's trying to explore here. Exactly. And also, you know, this idea of the Phantom Menace. You know, mm. the villain is standing next to you, but you are yep. so caught up in your own ego yep. that you cannot see, see. it grow. Growing, a right? growing right and underneath you. All the Jedi, all the politicians are culpable in the Empire's rise. Yes, right, a absolutely. Yeah, and and that, uh, and again, I don't. I wanted to focus on the Phantom Menace, but going through the Clone Wars, that is something that really kind of makes that more apparent. You know, when you're watching the Clone Wars, because you you realize that idea, and again, the idea that Lucas had of the Phantom Menace, yeah. you know, with the enemy being right there. When we get to A New Hope, and Obi-Wan Kenobi is talking about like the, the, you know, the death of the Jedi, like, mm. well, how do we go in just like a few years, years, a few decades, to there being almost no Jedi? Like, that's a huge question when you're watching The Phantom Menace. And the question is intriguing. Just the execution, the filmmaking is rough. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it, it is. But um, how do we look back at The Phantom Menace? I know you asked me that, and for you, you know, I know you had to reckon with your feelings at the time. I had to grow but up. But 25 years, it's been 25 years. <laughs> Stop reminding me. I, yeah, I know, I know. Where are you at with it now? Like, I actually really enjoy watching the prequels now. Okay. While recognizing that some of the uh, filmmaking flaws are, you know, inescapable. All right? <laughs> uh, but I, I appreciate what George Lucas was attempting with these movies. I yeah. think it's a mighty big swing. And there is a beauty in the attempt of that swing, right? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. they're not my favorite movies, any, you know, yeah. by any means. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't even necessarily call them good, <laughs> but they are important yes. for how we got here. The history of contemporary film, like I think this plays a big role in it. Okay. Um, and you know, I, I appreciate it for that fact too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the the lightsaber duels. You know, we saw the scene with Darth Maul and Obi Wan. Pod race still rad. The pod ra yeah, the pod race is Darth still, Maul still cool. You know, so I mean, there are some exciting and thrilling moments um, of filmmaking and of storytelling that we get with this as well. And I would like to think that we're on a journey. Uh, this is wishful thinking, maybe that we're on a journey with how we react to movies that don't necessarily deliver what we want, right? We were yeah. real jerks as fans, yeah. you know, to Ahmed Best and Jake Lloyd yeah. back in, you know, 1999. Yeah. We were real crybabies about it. We took this way too personally. Way too personally, right? yeah. And we continue to do that in the sequel trilogy. We need to get away from investing so much of our own selves yeah. in our entertainments. Exactly. They make a movie you don't like, 
They just made a movie you they didn't just, like. Yeah, you still just, got the other movies that you do like. Watch yeah, those. And just let and just let it go. So I mean, it's a retro review. So I guess we still have to kind of uh, yeah. get, give it a. Yeah. What, what's your What's your rating? What's your rank for this? I mean, we're the B and B show. You yeah. know, if we recommend something, we give it a B plus, and if we don't, we give it a B minus. Yeah. And I feel like who I am today, I have to give it a B plus. I yeah. think it is a compelling experience. Overall, I agree. Uh, it's a B plus for me as well. Uh, again, I was never that hard on the movie, even when I saw it back in '99. Well, you I didn't do... attach so much of yourself to it. <laughs> like I like made I did, my like my personality was Star Wars at the time. Yeah, and right, maybe we shouldn't make our personalities somebody else's story. <laughs> You're right. So even now, and I'm gonna say it one last time: 25 years removed Stop from it. it. I know. Um, it, it still it still works for me in different. I can still. Uh, Recognize its faults, but it still works for me in different in different areas. So it's a B plus for me. So yeah, those are our thoughts on our retro uh, 25th anniversary for the Phantom Menace. When we return, we're going to do spoiler. You've been warned. A spoiler review for X Men '97. Stay right there. Today's cancer research is tomorrow's victory. A victory that is there for the taking. Grab it. Now that was a great halftime speech. Let's go win. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Gambit, see your bed. And raise it! Cause the cards always be in my favor! The name's Gambit, on a me. Remember it. During a joyous and festive night on the island of Genosha, a sentinel attack puts Gambit in motion to protect his people and the woman he loves with the moment that changed the course of this season in X-Men 97. Speaking of nostalgia, Brian. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> X-Men 97, we're yeah. returning to that glorious animated era. Did you partake in that when you were younger? I, uh, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't. That's okay. I, I, I've, 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 I've watched. Th this was this was that era. I was like deep in the Power Rangers. I, I you had picked your team. I did. <laughs> I, had, I had picked. I, I had picked my color coded team. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I'm very familiar with the show, and I did watch episodes, but I wasn't like a diehard yeah. repeat. But you are familiar with the characters oh, because yeah. of the movies. You know who Wolverine was, oh, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. you understood like Bub was a thing that he said. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. fascinating watching. <laughs> X-Men 97 and seeing how, for me, it does justice to the memory of what the X-Men animated series was. Okay. Because I have gone back okay. and rewatched that show. Okay. And like the Phantom Menace, I had some problems with it when I was a kid because really? I was such a comic book nut, right? Oh, yes, you know, right, that's Chris right. Chris Claremont's that's comics right. with Jim Lee and Mark Silvestri and mm. Wallace Patricio, like those, that was my jam. You gotta do justice by that. And I never felt like the show okay. really did it. Okay. This does, and also the animation has evolved, and I feel like they're doing a great job yeah. of capturing the feel of what the classic animation was, yet still bringing a lot of anime influence yes. to it and contemporary design. Yeah. I think it looks phenomenal. Yeah, the, the show looks, and I guess we can start there with just the look of it and the animation of it, because you're right. I think when the trailer first came out, a lot of people were like, oh, okay, they are really paying homage to the 90s era, that style of animation, but really updating it for the modern era. There's like that rogue kick that's stretched across the entirety of the frame, yeah. right, where she's elongated. Yeah. Like, that is style, right? Like, yeah. that's doing something different. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and I love seeing all that and all like all the action sequences with all the anime influences is extremely apparent with a lot of the influences that it's pulling from from 97. And a tremendous amount of love for the yeah. characters, right? Yeah. And, and like you see it in that clip that we just showed, you know, like like the fact that we went there with Gambit. 
Dude, I mean, I, yeah, it, you're right. Episode five was a turning point for this show. And yeah, I did not see that coming. No. And I did not think that they would go there. And I'm glad that they did because the second half of this season, from what we see, what happens with the destruction of Genosha and the killing of Gambit, um, it takes these characters in some interesting directions. It takes these characters to prestige TV suddenly. Mm. Like like the first half of this season, you're like, yeah. okay, yeah, this is cool. I like this update of the animated series. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, what they're doing with Jean and Madeline Pryor in that third episode yeah. is extremely complicated and weird and very comics. <laughs> it's, it's, it's uncomfortable, <laughs> all right? It's super uncomfortable. And also yeah. we're not gonna like, you know, erase it. We're gonna let you sit and how uncomfortable that is. But it's still basically mm. just doing like the old show, but a little updated. Yeah, and it feels like that's the nostalgia. Yeah. Is, is bringing people back with those first four episodes. Yeah, and then with Gambit and re remember it. You know, like mm. now we're moving forward and yeah. we're going into a style of television uh, filmmaking that the original show just did not have. So, and but because I, I want to get deep into the back half of this episode, of, of this season. But I do want to touch on, I believe it was episode two, when they have uh, the, the UN summit. Yeah, when, yeah, when yeah. Storm, it is. When Storm loses her powers. Right, right, right. Because, yeah, it feels like the first half of this season is really kind of like building on nostalgia, but it also is dealing with you know, some really heavy stuff. But taking that, all the plot points from the comics. Like okay. that stuff is in the comics. It's all done a little bit differently. Okay. There's some shifts there, especially okay. the Madeline and Jean stuff. But like Storm and Forge, that's the life-death storyline. Yeah. Uh, their relationship, okay. I think, is beautifully captured in the, the few episodes that we got with okay. them in this season. Yeah. Like it's it, it, okay. it like the comics were melodrama. These were soap operas. Yeah with capes, right? Okay. And this is still doing that. Yeah, yeah, it feels like a soap opera. So those, those first three episodes, especially when we get to the reveal of Madeline Pryor, and when uh, uh, when Cable, uh, yeah, the, her son, her yeah, son like is Nathan, born, yeah. Nathan. There's all these relationship dynamics happening. There's the ones that are at like the forefront, like the romance between Scott and Jean, and now Madeline, the clone over here. Uh, but then you also have, you know, there's something going on with Storm and Forge that's mm. interesting. Obviously, Rogue and Gambit is the tragic relationship of this season. And if you're a Rogue and Gambit fan, I bet you this season was real rough for you. Yes. <laughs> there's the Magneto of it all with Rogue. With Rogue. But then and you also have something going on, and you really catch it on the rewatch, something going on between Morph and Logan, Wolverine. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, and yeah. The last scene between Morph and Logan in the final episode, yeah. I was crying. It's, it's, it's extremely touching. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great character dynamics. I mean, even with Jubilee and Sunspot. Yes, yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting things going on there. But then we get to episode five, and let's talk a little bit about that, and we'll talk more about it as we get into uh, um, the, the next segment as well. But then after Gambit dies, um, we see the shift in a lot of these characters, and we see the shift in Rogue. And I kept waiting for the rewind. Like, how are we gonna undo that? Undo it, yeah, right? Like, undo, I yeah. was impressed with the death that we see there. Yeah. And I thought, well, by the next episode, we're gonna work our way to bringing Gambit it's back. comics. Right, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I think maybe based on the final moments of this season, we're getting to that rewind. It's possible. There's yeah. a way that they can do it yeah. quite easily. Yeah. Um, the comics give them a way yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that they let us sit with that tragedy for the yeah. entire season, unexpected yeah. and satisfying. Yeah, and I, I, I love where it takes the character of Rogue because at that point, she becomes like my favorite character in this whole season as far as like what she's dealing with. Um, dealing with the grief of losing Gambit and she she kind of goes like on this whole this Vinch feel like quest um, and then you know we get cameos from you know when she runs into Captain America uh, her <laughs> taking the shield from Cap is one of the coolest things I've seen I, in the I loved MCU it. I loved it I yeah. loved it I, it's so petty but it, <laughs> it, was, it, it was great I love this interpretation of Steve Rogers how really? the X-Men see Steve Rogers is uh, delight for me. Yeah, because it really does feel like it's kind of creating that divide of where Yo, the X-Men stand. That flag you're wearing on your chest, mm. they're building robots, man. <laughs> robots to come kill me and my family. And yeah. you're Captain America? Mm. 
Yeah. Let, we got a couple more minutes in, in this segment, but uh, we'll talk more about this. But Bastion. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the, the villain. Yeah. The most this. boring supervillain in all of comics. And then, But then we also get Mr. Sinister. So yeah. it feels like uh, it's starting with Mr. Sinister, but then we realize that there's another big bad and Bastion. But you say he's the most boring and... Terrible in the comics. I hate really? him. No one likes him. His story is so convoluted, it makes no sense. And yet, here we are in this show, and you're like, I like this guy. <laughs> oh, okay. So it, it works. So it doesn't work I in the comics. I love Bastion. But it works. It definitely you works told here. told 13-year-old Brad that, you know, they're going to do justice by this character character in 2024, it's like, you're crazy. <laughs> you're crazy. It's not going to happen. But they do it. I think they do it, especially with the motivation, especially like getting his backstory, where he came from, the relationship that he has with his mother, what his ultimate plan is as far as reproducing yeah, well, the like Sentinels. A and few exceptions in this series, there is no real like villain villain. Right, like mm. everyone's got a motivation. And even like, you know, the hateful, racist, scum oh. soldiers, the, the Proud Boy stand in. Yeah, of this, uh, you, the Friends of yeah, Humanity. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. The, the Mutant Liberation yeah. Front. Not, no, not Mutant Liberation Front. I'm getting that wrong. Don't worry. Yeah. But those those guys. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, they're, they're telling their story in a very real world way. Yeah. You get them. Yeah. You're terrified by them. Yeah. But like, they, they feel like people you see on the news. Yeah, no, you're right, you're right. And I, we're, we're going to take a break, but I want to come back to that point because I also want to talk about the aftermath and the fallout from Genosha. Yeah. Because there's there some interesting things that I picked up on with that as well. So, uh, yeah, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with X-Men 97, so stay right there. Going to cheerleading camp next to the abandoned insane asylum, it's like throwing the blood away. 50% of Americans like watching blood get spilled in horror movies, but only 3% donated. it. Now that's scary. All right, and we are back. So yeah, let's go ahead and continue our conversation. That bit, the death of Gambit, and how he yeah. uses his powers to charge the Sentinel, oh, yeah. and turn the Sentinel into a weapon. Yeah. There's a lot of fun, you know, repurposing of powers in this show, mm. especially with Gambit. We see that moment in the first episode where he charges up Wolverine's claws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You know, then Morph turns into the blob as a trampoline and yeah. propels Logan onto the Sentinel and explodes. They're, I love how clever they're, they're really thinking about yeah. like, what would we do with this set of superpowers. Of, of superpowers, yeah. And, and going to Morph real quick, I mean, he felt like he was kind of like the Easter egg of the show. With yeah. Like who he was able to morph into yeah. and all the different characters that we got to see through his because morphing powers. Because he's not just morphing into a physical shape, right? Like when he becomes yeah. the Blob, he has the Blob's ability. When he becomes yes. Psylocke, he becomes he has Psylocke's ability. Exactly. Like that's a pretty powerful mutant. I yeah. think we need to respect Morph I, a little bit more. Dude, I'm like Quicksilver, the Hulk. I mean, he turns into a lot of, and like you say, he retains their power. So yeah, he's... Yeah, he, he's pretty powerful. Um, going to the aftermath of Genosha, uh, we talked a lot about, you know, the, the humans and the, uh, the mutants. And there's a point, there's a couple of different scenes that really stood out to me where you can see that the mutants were looking for help from, you know, all the other United Nations to try to rebuild Genosha. And, you know, uh, Cyclops is talking to the president. And he's, so he's like, the president's like, well, we can't, you know, expend this much resources to help. And, you know, it's just like how things, the, the optics of how things look. And I love that Cyclops hangs up on the president. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, the relationship that uh, uh, Beast has with the reporter, Trish, I believe it yeah. is. And there starts to be a divide when the mutants see that, okay, maybe the humans don't really have our back in the way that we thought that they did. And I always thought that that was an interesting conversation to have because it reminded me of something that Magneto said in episode two when he took the United Nations leaders up yeah. into space and he was like, don't let me let you down. Yeah, yeah. But it also, the inverse of that feels like the humans are constantly letting the mutants right, down. Right, right, absolutely. Like, this movie, this show, takes you to a point where it says Magneto is right, yes. right? We get it in the present tense, yeah. and you have to sit with that for a little bit, and you go, yeah, Magneto is right? And then it brings Charles Xavier back. He's been hanging out in space, yeah. getting married to Lalandra, yeah. and 
now you're like, well, what, what are you doing, Charles? And how are we supposed to feel about you? Like, he's a kind of like a, I want to eat my cake and have it too yeah. kind of guy. Yeah. And, and being that, he lets everyone down. It's, it's, uh, Professor X, especially when he comes back to Earth, is such a frustrating character. Yeah. Because, and, but I, I love the, the dichotomy between Magneto and Professor X because they have two opposing ideologies of how they approach the, the mutant-human relationships or relations. Um, and especially like when Charles Xavier comes back, he doesn't know what everyone's been, he doesn't know what they've been through with Genosha. Yeah. But yet he still has this idea of what uh, uh, his dream this, was. This is how it should be. This is how it should be, but it's like, you haven't been here to experience the devastation that we've, we've been, been going through. We've been pursuing your dream yeah. and it's not working, right? Yeah. Magneto is offering a different option, and it seems a lot more practical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, and then there's a there becomes a divide within the X Men. You know, when Magneto comes back, and he's just like, you know, who's going to come with me? And we see Rogue, Sunspot. I, I kind of got while he why he went with Magneto, but you start to see this divide. Um, but then it comes together so beautifully in like those last couple of episodes. Um, but yeah, I want to also talk about, we talk about the soap opera, and then I also want to talk about that family dynamic between Cyclops and Jean Grey and Cable and some of those final moments that we got between them. I thought it was beautiful the way they were able to um, have that so-called goodbye with yeah, Cable it, and, the, and the character of Cable, you what, know, his relationship with his parents. What you don't know based on just this season of television yeah. is that... Scott was abandoned by his father, right? And he, he and his brother Havoc grew up alone. Yeah. And, you know, that created a lot of strife and anguish. And the idea then when Nathan is infected by this techno-organic virus yeah. by Mr. Sinister, and the only cure is to give him to Bishop so that the child is raised in the future. Yeah. Like, he doesn't want to abandon, he won't be a part of abandoning his He's son. To, and in yeah. not being a part of abandoning his son, he abandons he his, son, his son, right? Yeah. But then we get some reconciliation yeah. with the son all grown up now as yeah. Cable. Man, I love comics. This I, is why I love comics. <laughs> and then what happens in the final moments of this series is Cyclops and Jean yeah. are propelled to the future where they can raise their child. So let's get to that before we uh, before we get for, before we get to the end of the show, where we leave the characters because now they're splintered. We have yeah. some characters in the past, we three thousand years yeah, ago. Some characters in the future. Yeah. We see Apocalypse. Yeah, the you know, young version, young version, and in the present day because we're possibly getting Gambit back as, as one of the four horsemen. Um, where do you see how this end and where we could go? Well, this is the Age of Apocalypse storyline, okay. right? Like, okay. So the future that they're in is ruled over by Apocalypse. Okay. And so we're going to see the beginning of Apocalypse's journey, this first mutant okay. in Egypt 3,000 years ago. And we're going to see where his story is going to end. And can we stop that future from occurring, and should we stop that future from occurring? Ah. And in the process, raise my son. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because they never got the chance to raise yeah. their son. Man, it's setting up all the character dynamics yeah. and all the drama. And who that woman is, I'm not going to spoil it, okay. under the hood, okay. who comes out in the future and greets them. Her relationship to Scott and Jean is interesting, too. Dude, I cannot wait for season two. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, all right, all right. We, we're going to get out of this segment. What's your rating for this? This is some of the most fun I've had watching TV all year. Yeah. Of course I loved it. It's a B plus for sure. Easily a B plus. It's one of the best series I've seen this year. Well, when I, By the end of this year, when I do a top ten of shows, it's definitely going to be in, in yeah. that. Yeah. Regard. Yeah, easily. And The Bad Batch concluded. We haven't even talked about I know, that, Brian. The bad, I know. We'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about that on another episode. But, Bad, bad, bad Batch is great. Uh, <laughs> so that is our show, and let's recap. Uh, so we did our 25th anniversary review for um, the, the Phantom, Phantom Menace. Menace. We gave that a yeah. B plus, and X Men '97. We gave that a B plus as a well. Much cherished film for Brian. <laughs> yes, it, yes, it, it is, it is. All right. So thank you for joining us on this latest episode of B and B Movie Reviews. Come be a part of the conversation. If you have questions, suggestions, feel free to email us at bnbmoviereviews at gmail.com. 
And with that, we will see you at the movies.